that he is faithful and just, even when we are unfaithful. That when we deny him, he cannot deny himself. And that is his power to keep us. Let's thank him today for it. Amen. But there is a word from the Lord today. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you right now for your keeping power. We thank you, God, that you kept us when we couldn't keep ourselves, Father. We ask right now, oh God, that you would prepare us for your word. That you would remove anything in our hearts and our minds, God, that would distract us or hinder us from receiving from, what, from you what you have for us today. Have your way in this place, oh God. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my Redeemer, in Jesus' name we do pray. Thank God, and amen. Amen. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to the book of Mark. The book of Mark, chapter 4, starting at verse 35. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35, when you find it, say amen. 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 And it reads, On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took, with, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace! Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear, and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? And 39, one more time. And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. I would like to speak from this subject and is uh, will be the title for the next few sermons for the week, I mean, excuse me, for the month, as we are entering a short mini-series entitled Surviving Storm Season. All right. All right. All right. Surviving Storm Season. All right. I'm so glad that it is warming up outside. Yeah. Yeah. Man, somebody. Yeah. Let me say that again. I'm so glad right. that it is warming up outside. I do not like the cold. Even though I grew up in the, sto the snowy state of Colorado, I have never liked the cold. It's funny because the weather ultimately ended up being one of the reasons that my wife and I had decided to go ahead and make that move out of Colorado. It was too cold for too long. Amen. It, it, it'll start snowing in September and it will snow all the way through to March. <laughs> too cold for too long. It's funny to me, and when I talk on the phone to my parents and we discuss the weather, they always tell me, uh, it's snowing here. And then I'm like, uh, well, it's 80 here, so, you know, <laughs> there's that. Uh, but there is a danger when it comes to the change of the season. Oh, oh. The season of storms. Uh -huh. yeah. Here in Oklahoma, we have tornado season. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In the deep south, they have hurricane season. Uh -huh. yeah. In India, they have monsoon season. All right. In Southeast Asia, they have tsunami season. All right. In South America, they have El Nino. All right. These are all periods of different seasons of storms. All right. All right. It seems like when the weather is just beginning to get good and consistently hot, and soon as the flowers begin to blossom, when the crop begins to bud, it seems like there's always a season of storms that interrupt the bliss and the comfort. Uh, just in case you missed it, just in case you thought I was still talking about the weather, there is a correlation 
that it seems like just in life too, that when things are finally starting to look up, the storm hits. Just when you thought things were about to get better, they take a turn for the worse. Just when you thought you were finally putting things together, that's when things fall apart. Just when you thought you were about to get the raise is when your job relocates overseas. Just when you thought you would always be with that person, you found out that they had a terminal illness. Just when you thought it could never happen to you, then it happened to you. Just when you thought you had escaped, you were walking into a trap. Just when you thought this was going to be your season of favor, but you found out that this was your storm season. Church, you know what a storm is. A storm can be anything that interrupts, interferes with, or, or ultimately knocks you off track with what you are pursuing in life. Yeah. Storms come, church, don't be fooled. That's right. uh, but we can look past the storm, amen? Yeah. Because what I found out about seasons yeah. is that seasons come and seasons go. Yeah. And storms come and storms go. This is how the songwriter said that trouble don't last always. Yeah. The Bible puts it like this, that pain may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. It don't matter what the storm is that you are facing, it's not gonna be, you're not going to face it forever. Amen. Now, the harsh reality of the storm is that we are in one of three places dealing with storms. Either one, you're in the storm, two, you're coming out of the storm, or three, you're headed into a storm. Uh, but I like to focus on the out part. Amen. Uh, but just in case you find yourself in a stormy situation, just in case you are making preparations, amen, for that storm. You do know that you, it is good to make preparations for the storm, amen. You remember when 2K uh, was getting ready to happen, everybody was afraid that the, that all the power was going to go out, the computer was going to go out, and everybody said, buy water, buy canned goods. And my mama had this kitchen, this pantry full of all this non-perishable items, and then the clock hit, and we said, Happy New Year, the lights were still on. <laughs> but guess what? We had a whole bunch of food to last us for a long time, amen, but we had some preparation. So today, I want to give you some preparation on how to survive the storm season. All right, all right, all right. We get to our text. Jesus has just had a big day. He, he's been teaching, he's been preaching, he's been giving these people these parables. Uh, there's been such a large crowd that they've been pressing him back that he didn't have a he didn't have a nice pulpit to preach from. Amen. He didn't have a, a, a nice mountain where he was. He didn't have no fieldy grass where he was. All he had was a boat. So he got in the boat and started teaching and preaching from the boat. He did this all day until finally it was nighttime. The crowd is still there. He tells the disciples, all right, let's go to the other side. Yes, Amen. The implication is he was done with kid. did what he was supposed to do there. His assignment was up. It was time for him to call it a night, relocate, and go to the other side because there was work over there to do. This leads me to my first point, church, that if you're going to survive the storm season, you're going to have to put confidence in his purpose, in his promise, excuse me, confidence in his promise. Look at verse 35, if you don't believe me, this is what it says. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Uh, you missed it. You're wondering, well, Pastor, where is the promise in that? The promise is in the plan. Because see, the storm that comes ahead, if you know the story, we read it so you know the story, amen, that there should not have been a reason for them to grow uh, uncomfortable in the storm because Jesus said, let us go over to the other side. Uh, let me make a plan for you. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. It don't matter what happens in between here and the other side, but I know that because Jesus told me we're going to the other side, we're going to make it to the other side. You may not be able to see the other side, but that is not a prerequisite for your belief. We walk by faith and not by sight. I don't need to know how I'm going to get to the other side, but I know that if Jesus told it to me, it's going to happen. He's going to work it out for our good and to his glory because he said it was going to happen. God gave Joseph some dreams. Amen. He told his brothers one day, uh, I had this dream that y'all bowed to me. The corn bowed to me. The sun, the moon, the stars, all these people bowed to me. They sold him into slavery. But do you know that eventually, while he was there in Egypt, they all ended up bowing to him to get some of that grain. And the sun, moon, the stars, and even uh, 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 Pharaoh himself, who considered himself, the sun even had to surrender his will to Joseph because Joseph knew better church. It will always happen. 
just the way that God told you that it would. Confidence in his promise. If you need another example, we just had one in Easter, amen. Jesus was promised that he would uh, be resurrected on the third day after his crucifixion. Jesus ultimately had to say, not my will be done, but let your will be done. He put his trust in the promise that his father had given him. He went through the cross, but early Sunday morning he got up with all power in his hands. If Joseph can trust God's promise, if Jesus can trust God's promise, and we see what God did for them, then so why not you put your trust, put your confidence in God's promise? He said, let us go over to the other side. What's interesting about this is they were going to cross the Sea of Galilee. They were in Galilee. They are in this region. But they had to cross to this uh, neighboring town to uh, Gethsemane. Amen. Uh, but, but the problem with this is it was a windy travel. If you knew anything about the maritime on this particular part of the Dead Sea, you knew that it was windy. Because the way that the mountains are set up, the way that the wind comes down, if you're going to cross, it was more than likely going to be a rough passage by boat. It was the quickest passage. But it was rough. Right. So it's interesting to know that Jesus determines that we're going to take not the scenic route. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We're going to take a shortcut, but it's going to be rough. Yeah. And all this time you wonder, why are you going through this situation? Situation? Why is this storm before you? Why are you in a tough spot? Maybe God is trying to get you somewhere quicker, but it's just going to take a, a bumpy route. Amen. Yeah. And that's a word for somebody. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody says, uh, why couldn't I just let this thing play out? Why did I have to go through this, that, or the other? But this, that, or the other could have kept you from somebody else on the outside. Amen. Amen. Come on. Traffic is backed up. You on your way home from work. Amen. Yeah. You had your mind set on this meal that you want to go to such and such, but no, there's a detour. Amen. Yeah. Little did you know that God put you on this track because had you gone that way, you may have had a head-on collision. Yeah. So you just be satisfied with the route that God has paid for you and be content that maybe God has saved you from some things that you couldn't save yourself from. Yeah. In any case, I'm going to put confidence in his promise. Because yeah. when I found out that God has never broken a promise. Uh, they used to say he's a, he's, a, he's a doctor that's never lost a patient. He's a lawyer that's never lost a case. My God has never broken a promise. The Bible says that he is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. So if he said it, it's going to happen. Ooh, uh, God just gave you something for you, church. But you can't trust God's promises if you don't know what he promised you. Bible that you have that's sitting there like the dust in your windshield, amen. God has got some promises for you, and if you don't know what the promises are, you can't receive them. You can't receive no weapon form to get you your property. What well, have the enemy coming against you? Well, do you know that you have a sword? Do you know that you have the faith? A shield of faith? You can't do war against the enemy if you don't have a weapon in your hand. Amen. They say defense wins games, but yeah, but offense put points on the board, so you gotta have to know how to swing this sword to come against the enemy. Confidence in his promise. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. That should have been enough. Uh, but you know how we are, amen. Uh, we need a little bit of extra, so let me go ahead and move to my second point. Number two, put comfort in his presence. Take comfort in his presence. Take comfort in his presence. Jesus didn't send the disciples on a boat and then uh, just send them away. Amen. He said, let us go to the other side. So they were in the boat together. Amen. Jesus is there. He's on the boat. They still scared of the storm. But Jesus is on the boat. It should have been enough for them to know that they were going to make it on the other side if Jesus is on the boat. If God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that means he's right there in the storm with you. That should be enough for you to know that you're going to make it to the other side. Yeah. You want to survive this storm, you better take comfort in his presence. Yeah. Yeah. I know the storms are real. I'm not trying to diminish your experience. Uh, I don't know why bad things happen to good people. They do. But what I do know that God promised that he would be in the midst of it with us. Yeah. That God suffers with us. He cries with us. And he comforts us. So you take comfort in his presence. When I was younger, uh, I, I couldn't have been much older than seven or eight years old. Uh, we were, uh, My parents were still married. That's how I know. So we were living in this apartment complex. And uh, this, there was this terrible thunderstorm happening. The worst thunder I had heard 
prior to moving to Oklahoma. <laughs> the thunder was so bad it was shaking the house. And one and one big bolt hit somewhere, I guess, I don't know, but it, it was so loud, the lights went out. And so, and so I'm running around the house panicking, I'm looking for my dad. Uh, um, and, he, and there he is, standing on the balcony with the balcony open, with the rain coming down in the thunderstorm. Yeah. Took me by surprise. I didn't know what to think. I'm thinking, why is he out there? Hey, Amen. I'm trying to run around the house to find him. And he's out there where the storm is. Yeah. So I went, you know, at a safe distance. And, and, so he, and so he looked at me. And he said, what's wrong with you? He could tell something was wrong with me. I said, it's, I'm scared. Amen. Yeah. Uh, the thunder is loud. So I wanted to get where he is. And he said, if I'm not afraid, you don't need to be afraid. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, I started to feel a whole lot better. Simply because I was in his presence. Yeah. If he knew the storm couldn't hurt him, then I knew the storm couldn't hurt me. Yeah. Because he was there, I was comforted by his presence. Church, don't you know that God is there with you, you should be comforted by his presence. Ooh, Jesus is, Jesus is good. I love this part, church. Uh, Jesus is in the stern, sleep on the pillow. <laughs> Listen, Jesus just spent all day ministering to people. He's tired. He's sleeping. He want to get his sleep on. Amen. That good uh, drool at the mouth type of sleep. But I started thinking about who he was talking to and the people that he was dealing with. Amen. These were church folk, amen. Amen. These were the crazy folk at work that you don't want to look at, amen. You're looking forward to the weekend because you just don't want to deal with them for folks at work anymore. But guess what Jesus does? Jesus goes to sleep. Ooh, that's a word. Let me stop there, parenthetically, church, and let you know that I don't care what they say at work. I don't care what you have to deal with at work. Don't you let people take your sleep away from you. Jesus said, I'm going to go to sleep. Your stress, don't let it take away your sleep. Your strength ain't work. You missing out on sleep. You said, I'm going to sleep. Jesus went to sleep. He's tired. He's ready. He wants to rest. He sleep on the pillow. He's the only one sleep. He's the only one not worried. <laughs> Everybody else is cared. He's carefree. Uh, but, then, but then where the disciples start to mess up is, they say, teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? If you read the rest of the text, they say, uh, later on they say, what kind of man is this? Who is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. Right. Let's me know that they weren't counting on Jesus to, to stop the waves. They didn't know that he could make the waves be still. Yeah. So they're asking Jesus to wake up so that possibly we can either A, turn back around, or B, you can just be afraid with us because the misery loves coming. They weren't asking for a miracle. They just want to know what, what you think about. This. Don't you care that we're perishing church? God is going to see you through this thing. Amen. But they, they allow Jesus' inactivity to determine their fear. Just because God don't seem like he's doing anything don't mean he don't care about it. It just means it ain't a big enough deal for him to do something about it. <laughs> Listen, I know how it is to be sick. Amen. I know how it is to have a cold and to have the sniffles and you feel miserable and you're, and you're praying to God and you say, woe is me, Lord, why won't you heal me from this common cold? Yeah. Well, maybe it ain't a serious enough issue for God to come to your rescue. You doubt God because you got the sniffles. But God said, don't you know that it will run this course? I did create a body. I did create white blood cells. Like you do have an abuse. It's just way out. Yeah. You're going to make it to the other side. I know that's not what you wanted to hear. You want to hear name and claim it. You want to hear that you can speak it and it'll come into existence. You want to hear healing over your body. But not all of the time. Sometimes you just got to wait the storm out. But just because Jesus is not doing anything does not mean he doesn't care about you. He's just not concerned about the problem. Yes, Braveheart, hey amen, this is a good movie but when, when, when the uh, Mel Gibson's character is getting ready to go up against the problem he says, uh, he, they're outnumbered he says that the that the, uh, the cause is greater than the opposition yeah. Yeah. meaning that what we're fighting for is bigger than the fight itself yeah. uh, so what God can be doing in and through you can be bigger than the situation you're fi than the situation that you're facing yeah. Yeah. there's comfort in his presence yeah. Yeah. Uh, he gets out of the boat he gets upset uh, and you'll see why I say this in a moment. He gets upset a little bit. He's annoyed. If you have kids, 
Yeah. Or you ever been a kid and been told this before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes the kids will get loud, I'm trying to take a nap, I'm trying to rest, trying to work on some stuff, trying to study, and the kids are making so much noise, I come out of the room, I say, sit down and be quiet. <laughs> That's essentially what Jesus said. Yeah. You know, we like to hear the gospel music, we like to raise the hands and the peace be still, it's real serene. It's not a serene scene at all. It's not a scene of serenity. When Jesus says peace, it translates into Shut up. <laughs> Amen. And then when it says be still is the word that they would use to put a muzzle on something. Oh, yeah. So it's an involuntary submission that the waves have to do. The waves still want to act a fool. Yeah. But Jesus tells them, y'all need to sit down and be quiet. Yeah. And so they get quiet. So that annoyance that he got from being disrupted is what caused them, what caused him to wave his hand and to rebuke the sea. Right. He didn't just talk to it, he rebuked it and tell it to sit down and to be quiet. Church, that's how it's got to be for some of us today. That you have situations going on in your life. You can't get up and just talk to it. You can't get up and be real nice to it. You can't be serene and try to do all this prayer, hands, and, and all this kind of stuff. You got to get mad at some point and say, enough is enough. You need to sit down and be quiet. Sickness, you ought to sit down and be quiet. Depression, you ought to sit down and be quiet. Low self-esteem, peace, be still. Poverty, peace, be still. Failure, peace, be still. Doubt, peace, be still. Is there anybody in this place today that wants to speak to your situation? That wants God to speak to your situation and say, peace, be still. Is Lord over the sea. And they should have known about this. Amen. They should have known about this with this peace be still. Now there's comfort in his presence. And when he says this, it's good to know that he's there. But my third point is this. Uh, after you put confidence in his promise, after you take comfort in his presence, three, you need to consider his power. Consider his power. Peace be still is real good, but the story doesn't end with him controlling the wind and the waves. Yeah, right. There has to be a realization of who God is and what he does so that he can get the glory for it. God doesn't just work miracles in our life for the sake of you just having a miracle done for you. He works for miracles so that he in turn will receive the glory. It is to reveal something about him that is greater. Amen. So he says, peace be still, everything stops. Let them know right off the bat that he's God. Only God can control his creation. Amen. Amen. I'll do it. Only God can control his creation. So when he says, peace be still, talking to the wind and the waves, that would have been enough for me to say, hey, I don't have to doubt anymore. I was on this boat. Now to die, the boat's breaking up, the water is up to our ankles. But he said, peace be still, and it stops. What other questions do you need to have? What other proof do you need, church? Can he heal your body? Did he provide for you when you could provide for yourself? You didn't know where that money was coming from, but you had food on the table. It was like Jesus was in your own house, breaking food and feeding your family. You didn't know where it all came from. How did mama feed all these people on Thanksgiving with just two fish and five loaves? But he did it somehow. I don't have a reason to doubt. Uh, consider his power. Jesus says to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Then it says, they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. Interesting that it wasn't the other way around. After the rebuke, then they get afraid. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? You have little faith in other texts. Um, and so here's my observation. In chapter 1, he cast out demons, healed a multitude, and he cured a paralytic. Chapter 2, he healed a paralyzed man. He embarrassed the Pharisees. Chapter 3, he healed the man with the withered hand. And he had to deal with his mother and his brothers. In chapter 4, he preached and teached like never before. So his answer, why do you still have no faith based on what you've seen in this past few times? Based on what you've seen in chapter 1, 2, and 3 of your life. Why all of a sudden in chapter 4 are you doubting what he can do? If he did it in chapter 1, if he did it in chapter 2, if he did it in chapter 3, if he did it in chapter 4, if he did it in chapter 45, chapter 50, however old you are, whatever chapter you are, if he did it previously, he can do it again. The Bible says that he, does, that he does not change. Amen? Uh, how did Ty Trippin say it? If he did it before, he'll do it again. Same God right now, same God back then. So who is this man? I want to tell you who this man is. This man is the Rose of Sharon. Who is this man? This man is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Who is this man? This man is everything. This man is the great I am. This man is the living water. This man is the bread of life. This man is uh, my rock in a time of need. This man is fire uh, when I'm cold. Amen. This man is rain in a weary land. This man is everything that you need. This man's name is Jesus. Whatever you need him for, I dare you to call on this man. This man can wave his hands and the peace will be still. This man is capable of doing more than you can imagine. Yeah. 
consider his power church. Yes. Yes. If he can't do it, nobody can. Yes. Uh, you ever heard the expression of uh, something you just got to do by yourself? Amen. Yes. But that's not how it is with God. Because when you can't do it, I know a God who can. Yes. And his name is Jesus. God bless you. Yes. 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 Yes.